of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Beloved, you are our God. We will praise you with joyful lips. Our souls thirst for you. We behold your power and majesty. Beloved, you are our God. We will bless you all the days of our lives. Amen. Remembering the Word made flesh, the resurrection of Jesus, and the dawn of new light on Easter Day, we gather now in the light of this candle. Let us pray. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our bodies and spirits this day, beloved God, that we may be healed of our faithlessness, freed from our fears and anxieties, and placed on the pathways of peace and service to you. We ask this in Christ's own name, be with us and bless us even as we pray, uttering our prayer. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Good morning and welcome to you all gathered here by electronics since we're still locked down due to COVID-19. This is the online service for Lent 3, March the 7th, 2021 for Valois United Church in Pont Claire, Quebec. I'm Reverend Dr. Scott Hunter, the minister of the parish. And it's hard to believe when Easter is only about a month away. On April 4th, we'll be celebrating Easter again this year. It's very hard to believe. This is the third Sunday of Lent. The third Sunday of Lent was the beginning of the COVID uh, scenario for us here at church. That was our last regular normal service this time last year. And so we're mindful of those things as we gather today. A couple of announcements. Um, I encourage you all to continue preparations for Easter. It will be very simple Lent and Easter again this year. Um, I would encourage you to take something on during this season of Lent. It might be a prayer every day, or perhaps it's doing something simple for someone that you know. But take something on. We've already given up plenty of things, particularly in our connections with each other. It's time to take something on something simple that we could dedicate ourselves to and find God in during this season, drawing us closer and turning us towards God. That's what Lent is for, it's to turn us towards God as we approach Easter. Zoom coffee hours continue each Wednesday from 10 to 11 a.m. It's a way to gather and enjoy each other's company. Yes, we're using electronics once again, but it is a way to connect with others and see them if we wish. Um, you can also use your telephone to, to sign in and talk to people, and, and you don't have to have a, a computer or a device, anything special, you can use your telephone. Um, if you would like to be part of that, then let us know, either phone in or else uh, send us your email coordinates and we'll make sure that you have passwords and other things so that you can use these, uh, these things that are helping us to feel a little less lonely, a little more involved with each other. If you need pastoral care, Contact instructions to reach me on the church answering machine. Uh, you will find my cellular number there, and you're please invited to call. And I'd, be, I'd be very happy to hear from you and to talk with you about whatever is troubling you or whatever you're excited about. Um, it's there for your use, and uh, do not be afraid to call if you need to. Offerings. Um, you can mail or drop off checks at the church. Um, 
email transfers can be sent to the treasurer. There's also a donation button on the church website. Uh, those are all ways of contributing to the costs of our church family and uh, giving our gifts to God. Um, offering envelopes are available to the church, and if you contact Debbie Dixon, she'll make sure you have them as soon as possible. We've had year end, and reports have been written, and the report booklet has been prepared, and been made available to you um, when it is completely finished. And um, please read it, take a look at things. If you have questions or concerns, um, send your questions or concerns to people on the guidance board. We'll do our best to answer the questions you have. Uh, we're deferring the annual meeting, I think, until we can all gather, and uh, so that everybody can participate. Uh, but until then, if there are questions, um, please uh, please contact. We don't have to sit in, in a quandary about something. If it can be addressed, um, we will do so. Um, if you have specific prayer requests for a Sunday service, send us a first name only, and we will pray for the person you're mindful of during the prayers of the people portion of the service. God knows who we are and what our concerns are before we even ask. Um, so I assure you, you won't be alone in your prayers, and we'll pray with you. Uh, simply send a first name only. Young people. Have you ever known someone who kept a rule and yet still showed disrespect? Wow. Sam knew the rules, but he used rules in his favor. He would use anything to get ahead or to get the better of somebody else. One day, he obeyed the rules. Yet, he showed terrible disrespect. It was a cold day in the class because the classroom had its windows open, all because of the virus. And everybody was a little grumpy and irritated, including the teacher. And Sam picked this day to try to get the better of the teacher. Take your math books out and turn to page 25, the teacher said. And everybody took their math books out. But Sam took an extra long time doing it. And people around Sam's desk smiled as he tested the teacher's patience. Um, what's taking you so long, Sam? The teacher asked. Oh, oh, nothing. Just doing what you asked, Sam replied. A few moments later, the teacher wrote a problem on the board. Does anyone know the answer to the problem? The teacher asked. Sam's arm shot straight up. I wonder if you should call on Sam and sat silent. Well, what's the answer? Sam sat there silent again. Others in the class began to catch on, and a few giggled. Sam, do you know the answer? The teacher asked, as his patience wore thin. Sure, said Sam, smiling. Eventually, he gave the answer. Throughout the rest of the day, Sam tested the teacher's patience, trying to wear the teacher down, and some of the other students saw him doing this, and they tried to do the same thing. It was not a good day in the class. At the end of the day, the teacher asked to see Sam after class. Why are you showing me disrespect, the teacher demanded. I don't know what you're talking about, Sam said with a knowing smile on his face. I kept all the rules. I answered your questions, didn't I? And it was Sam's last attempt to get to the teacher. We'll talk again another day, the teacher sighed. Sam kept the rules, sure he did. But he showed terrible disrespect. He used the rules to try and get his way to make himself look better than the others, to entertain his friends. But it wasn't the right thing to do. God gave us rules to show respect. They're often called the Ten Commandments, and you'll hear them later. The first three commandments show respect to God, and the last seven show respect to others. We can keep the rules and still not show respect. And that would not be 
the right thing to do. How hard is it to do the right thing? Well, you think about that as you listen with the adults to the scripture readings for today. The first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 to 20. It's often called the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, whether in the form of anything that is heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will acquit anyone who mis will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Seven, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servants, or your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, the rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long on the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female servant, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at the distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading today comes from John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And the Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Will you raise it up in three days? He was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone. He himself knew what was in everyone. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. So we're back to dabbling in John's story of Jesus, having moved from Mark's story for now. And John's gospel, of course, varies from his synoptic cousins in a variety of ways. And the reading today is one example. Rather than Placing Jesus cleansing the temple at the end of Jesus' public ministry is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John places it at the very beginning of the story. You see, each gospel writer presents flavored first century confessions of faith and, and not historical accounts as we might wish for, in an orderly kind of fashion, chronologically in this 21st century. The synoptics, they, they cast the 
The description of the temple is the final provocative act of Jesus that precipitates his arrest and trial and crucifixion. But John uses the same scene a little bit differently to announce the inauguration of a brand new era, one where the grace of God is, is no longer mediated or accessed through temple sacrifice, but is available to all through Jesus, embodied God's Messiah. And Jesus says the temple has been turned into a marketplace, but it had to be a marketplace, or at least have a marketplace, so that devout Jewish people could purchase animals for sacrifice and exchange imperial coins for local currency to make those kinds of purchases. So when Jesus drives the animals out of the temple, overturns the tables of the money changers, and demands the end of buying and selling, He's really announcing the end of this way of relating to God. A new era is being announced where the presence of God is embodied. You know, I was reflecting this past week on what trips my parents to go shopping used to be like when I was a young boy. And when we went shopping, there was no escaping other people. Now I go off to Walmart or the IGA grocery store and I hardly ever see anyone that I know. Back then, in the late 60s and early 70s in Peterborough, where I grew up, whenever I went shopping with my, my dad or my mom, we always saw people that we knew. Some of the people who ran the shops were, were people that they knew from church or from high school days because my father had grown up there. And because my father was a teacher and a teacher of teachers, we would run into former students or, or colleagues or other teachers that he had taught. As a shy little kid, I, I learned to stand there awkwardly behind my father until he was done talking to whomever had approached and, and spoken to him. And then as soon as the person left, I would ask, who was that? Shopping, it was a very relational thing. Very relational thing to go to the stores or off to the market. And 70% of the time was about seeing and talking with people. And 30% was about getting something or looking for something that was needed. But there was no hiding. Being on relational with Walmart or ordering online and not even seeing the delivery person or, or COVID non-relational moments. They just weren't possible. I remember going into Herb's menswear with my dad, where he apparently had purchased his clothes since late high school. Herb Shacker and his wife Rose ran the place, a little shop in downtown Peterborough where we lived, and families like the Blacks and the Pulvers and the Rogos and Silvers and others ran those enterprises, and Herbie and Rose ran the menswear store. And Herbie was a, a pleasant little man, and his wife Rose was this, this extroverted lady. My dad knew them both, and he said they could really sell, too. Rose would say, in between puffs of smoke, Bob, Bob, I just said to Herbie, that shirt is Bob Hunter. In between puffs of smoke, I would hear, Bob, what do you think? Bob, Bob, Bob. And that shirt would be a color that my father would never touch. And I remember Herbie once saying to me, that boy would look good in pinstripes. And he put this, this pot off a looking small man's jacket and was thrown around my six or seven year old body. You know, you couldn't cut it down for him, Bob. Puss of smoke everywhere. It was a body of it. Body and time, relational, unavoidable kind of event, which I'm sure many must have experienced in those days. And so I'm left wondering, what was going on in that temple marketplace long ago? I'm wondering what sort of relational, unavoidable events were happening between people. People with bodies. Bodies, we have them, we are them. Sometimes we don't know what to do with them when we're relating and connecting in the marketplace of life. 
bodies. Sometimes I'm going to change them, improve them, shrink them, hide them. We want to tighten them, shape them, mold them. We compare ours to theirs. We, we describe them in strange categories like, like food. That one's pear-shaped. That one's beefy. We analyze them. We take them apart. We, we like some parts better than others. We take them for granted. We look at them in the mirror with disgust or with modest admiration. We keep the lights off so that they can't be seen. We expose them in ways that leave little to the imagination. I doubt I'm saying anything that you have not felt or noticed about relational body events or even your body at some point in your life. But he was speaking the temple. We know the circumstances of the temple incident in John are different than in the other Gospels. We know the theological claim Jesus is making in this very different temple skirmish story. He's announcing a, a new way of relating to God. It's out of oil. It's relational. It's a body kind of event. And what I'm drawn to thinking about is bodies. The temple of his body. God chose to, to localize love in a human body. That God decided that becoming human was a good thing. See, since God made the decision to be incarnated, it seems to me God was probably not very choosy about bodies. Sure, God became human, but we take this incarnation seriously. And that God loves the world the full expression of relational human bodies is at stake. Otherwise, incarnation is, well, partial and penultimate. You can't be partly human or selectively human. If you are human, well, that means the whole thing. The temple of his body, John says. Why does this matter? I mean, when was the last time you thought about how your body Expresses the gospel. How your body communicates the message as much as your words. How can your body reveal truth about the truth you carry? We tend to get very caught up in words these days. Preachers, I know, are, and we avoid our bodies by wearing robes and we hide behind pulpits and lecterns, and we're relieved that we only have to figure out what to do with our bodies when we're about to waste them up. There's no usually behind the pulpit usually sit in a pew, but are now at home watching this, and when was the last time you thought about what to do with your body? Do you pace some days? Do you flail around with your arms and your interactions? Your body is who you are. Your body communicates your message as much as the words that you carefully construct with your interactions and your family these days, or perhaps are using on Zoom. What does this all mean? Well, maybe it has nothing to do with who you'll be this week, or maybe it has everything to do with who you will be. Calling attention to the fact that bodies matter in all shapes and sizes changes us. That who you are as witnesses to God's love in the world is not just about our words. That actually our calling is not just telling people about Jesus, but somehow embodying Jesus for others. How not just our words and actions, but our actual body communicates the love of God, the very presence of God, unavoidably in the marketplace of our lives. Bodies matter. Your body matters. Incarnation is not just talk or voice or speech. It's how your body embodies the truth of the gospel. And how our bodies have felt what it feels like to experience grace upon grace. You know, Lent is going to be a body anointed, a body beaten, a body on a cross, a body laid in a tomb. What does that feel like? The only way we get at that is to embrace our own Lent, Easter, our theology cannot be fully captured or experienced in 
heady confessions or lofty logic or in our need for knowledge, Lent invites reflection on the role of our bodies in faith, in theology, and life. They are how we relate with each other, and apparently how we experience and relate with God. In the end, Jesus is saying that his body is the location of God, and yours is too, and it has to be. God is counting on because God loves the world. And Jesus is counting on because his incarnation came to an end on that cross. And this week, embody your faith, your meaning, and your purpose, and your value. And explore how your body ministers as much as, well, your words. Imagine how your body carries unavoidable message and interaction as much as words. Because then the word becomes flesh again and again and again in the marketplace, in the town, in memory, and in childhood today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow in a few moments. Beloved God, this is the season of turning. We are called on this journey of Lent to turn our lives to you, O God. Turning away from those things that have harmed us and others and to separate ourselves from actions and attitudes that demean and destroy. And it is far too easy for us to sink into the mire of self-pity or self-serving attitude, wondering why everything isn't coming our way. Contentment, no stress and no struggle, and yet our lives are filled with stress and discontent. We hurt, beloved. We hurt in our bodies, in our souls. We hurt in our relationships with others. How we must try in our patience. We don't want to be like this. We want to feel the warmth of your love and the freedom of your spirit and the joy of serving you. So now we ask you to forgive our selfishness and our foolishness and move us beyond those things to wisdom. Heal us. We ask these things in Christ's own name. We are given another chance. God has heard our cries. We turn again to God. Find comfort and strength in God's eternal love. Be healed. Rejoice in the forgiveness of God. We put so much off sometimes until the last second. You've invited and encouraged us on this journey, reminding us of the struggles and of the hope. You've asked us to let go of the things that bind us from serving freely, but we have this terrible tendency wait. To wait until it's almost too late, until the last minute. We can't seem to let go of the hurt or the fear or the pain, and on this journey remind us again of your healing love, O oh God, your forgiving power. And help us to trust the goodness and potential for good that you've placed in us all. We have come to this place to hear your word, to meditate on it, and to pray to you with Enable us to find the courage to believe in you, that your healing love might permeate our bodies and souls and prepare us to be witnesses. For all of this we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Today, O oh God, we pray for those who are on March break and for those who are just about ready to break. We pray for parents. We pray for children. We pray for grandparents and neighbors, struggling to make sense of things and wanting and needing a break. Use this time to encourage them and to fill them with new life. We also pray for the sick and the dying and the bereaved, people who are imprisoned and people who are anxious and fearful, and for those who are feeling hopeless or sad and lonely. 
speak to their needs and use good people around them day by day to sustain them. Help them to find ways to borrow the faith of others. Use our bodies well, O God, in this coming week as we serve you. Use us as vehicles of your love and for the purposes of your redemptive work in the world. We offer ourselves in Christ's name. Go now and testify to God's faithful promises. Go now and follow God's ways. Go now and proclaim God's good news. Go with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, we pour sand on the marker of time. Listen now to the beautiful music. 